different news articles are broaching the topics of glass ceiling and women. And I'm going to talk about this one from CBS News, and I'm going to talk about one from Fortune. But let's get into this one. CBS News says, it's not the glass ceiling holding women back at work. Um, new analysis finds. The struggle women face landing senior leadership roles in corporate America is commonly blamed on the glass ceiling, the metaphorical gender barrier that blocked their ascent to the highest levels of management. Yet new research indicates that problems for women in the workforce begin far lower down the professional ladder. And I want to talk about this, especially as more and more women are out enrolling men getting into college, there's going to be the opportunity for more and more of the younger generation to get into management if we know where women have been faltering in the past. So we're introducing a new term, the broken rung. Women early in their careers are far more likely to stumble on a broken rung or failing to get a promotion out of their entry level jobs at the same rate as men, according to a new study from the consulting firm McKinsey & Co., and Lean In, the nonprofit started by former Meta COO Sheryl Sandberg. For every 100 male employees promoted from entry-level jobs to managerial roles, only 87 women received a similar promotion, according to the report. The broken rung is even harder to surmount for women of color, with only 73 receiving their first promotion for every 100 men who are moved up. So it's important to know the numbers right here because this is where we can work to improve it at the entry level job. That failure to climb the ladder isn't due to lack of ambition. With the survey of 27,000 workers finding that women have the same goals for advancing their careers as men, but bias may play a role with corporate ladders often promoting young male employees on their potential while young women are judged more by their track work records, a tougher standard when female workers are just starting in their careers. So that whole thing where women and black people, you know, we know that you have to work that much harder to overcome the mediocrity of the potential of white men. Social science would tell you that gender bias and bias around what a leader looks like all of that is much more likely to creep in when employees have shorter track records. Eliminating the glass ceiling may seem easier given that the pipeline is smaller at the top of the corporate hierarchy, but it's the broken rung where more attention needs to be focused because that will unlock more opportunity for women, leading to a greater number of leadership roles and potentially boosting the share of women in C-suite roles. The share of women in C-suite now stands at 28%, up from 17% in 2015. We don't face a constraint on ambition. The pandemic created major headwinds for many women in the workforce with millions dropping out of their labor market as schools and childcare centers shuttered. While women have returned to the job market in force, many say they prefer hybrid or flexible roles, which have become more common as the health crisis receded. That may have fueled a notion that women's ambition is waning, but that's not the case. Indeed, 96% of women said their career is important to them, and 81% want to be promoted to the next level this year, matching men's aspirations at work. The impact of microaggressions. Another myth about women in the workplace is that micro, microaggressions or comments or actions that subtly demean a person based on their gender, race, or other attributes are a minor issue but analysis have found that they can have lasting and damaging impacts on women at work. For instance, the study found that women are twice as likely as their male colleagues to be interrupted or hear comments about their emotional state while they are more likely than a man to have a coworker take credit for their work. This is why many women want the, the remote work, the work from home jobs, because they can just do their job, see the results without hearing those microaggressions. Now, this part in the middle, in fact, 29% of women who work remotely say one of the biggest benefits is the reduction of unpleasant interaction with coworkers. Now, by the flip side, I believe that this is why many men, and let's face it, more men are in leadership positions, want to bring people back into the job because they get to suck the, the energy, the intelligence, the creativity from the people there and take credit for it. Whereas when you're working remotely, your work is your work and you have to show your work. 
And so you can't just, you know, suck the intelligence and creativity from um, the lower levels and call it yours. Now I want to move into part of this Forbes article. Forget those lazy girl jobs. Women's ambition is higher than ever. Landmark report finds. I'm not going to read this whole article, but they were calling um, lazy girl jobs basically those jobs where you can work from home. But it really isn't about that. Girls and women just want to have some boundaries where it comes to work. So there's nothing lazy about women who are seeking better work-life boundaries. In fact, data shows that at every level of corporate of the corporate pipeline, women are committed to their um, careers as their male counterparts. Okay, so that's the introduction. Okay, this quote towards the middle of this paragraph, rather than flexible work being something that is muting ambition, is actually unleashing it because what we hear men and women say equally is that the ability to have some amount of work and hybrid work makes them feel more efficient and productive. So people are actually working. So I don't know why the castigation against people who want to work from home. Okay, the middle of this first paragraph, higher levels of men report receiving in-person mentorship and feedback, connection to the work and mission and a sense of being in the know and from office attendance. This is one of the reasons why they prefer to be in the office. And this is why I said just a little while ago that they prefer it because they need to take the creativity and the intelligence from other people. That is what I believe. And like I said, this is my opinion on the data. Meanwhile, women and particularly those from marginalized or historically excluded communities are feeling like the office is a minefield of microaggressions. Recognize that this is finally being researched. We have been telling folks that we have to work two times harder just to overcome the most media, um, mediocre of white men. There is a reason because they get promoted by what they look like and we get cast aside at times. Nearly three quarters of women who experience this treatment self-shield, meaning they speak up less in the workplace, code switch, feel pressured to change their appearance or behavior, and otherwise internalize the pressure to conform. This is what happens when you go in and you have to acquiesce and try to assimilate into culture rather than allowing your work to speak for yourself. Microaggressions are real, and they can, as it says at the bottom, hamper a woman's career progression. I'm glad that we are speaking on this and that they are finally doing some research on this. I'm going to end it with this. We know these women are more likely feeling need, feeling the need to be perfect, which gets in the way of them fully showing up and fully speaking up at work. Companies are really missing out on everything that women have to offer. I'm glad we are seeing this. And so women, they are talking about the broken wrong. So what are we going to do to prepare our teens our daughters, our children for these positions at the bottom level. We have to continue to give them the opportunity to be assertive, confident, speak up for themselves, all of that early on so that when they do launch, they are ready for the corporate environment if they want to take those steps. Y'all jump in the comments and let me know what you think on this one.